Ed Robertson welcoming you to TV Confidential. Radio talk show about television, though, play part two of our conversation with Lou Antonio in our second hour. Lou Antonio, Emmy-nominated and Directors Guild of America-nominated director of more than 200 hours of network and cable television and an actor who has appeared in more than 60 popular films and TV series, including Cool Hand Luke, Splendor in the Grass, Gunsmoke, I Dream a Genie, and The Fugitive. Lou will share a few stories about working with David Jansen, Wayne Rogers, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., and Elizabeth Taylor. Plus, I'll talk about the role that he played in discovering Renee Zellweger and Henry Thomas. Lou Antonio will join us in our second hour. We hope you'll stay tuned for that. Coming up later on in this hour, we will play part two of our conversation with Grammy-nominated singer, comedian, radio host, and showbiz raconteur, Jeffrey Mark Jeffries. Latest book is a comprehensive biography of Ella Fitzgerald that covers everything from Ella's beginnings with the bands of Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and Chick Webb to her many appearances on television all over the world, as well as her famous Memorex commercials and everything in between. Among other things, we'll talk about Ella's ability to sing just about any song, no matter what genre, and still make it sound like her own, and how she first learned what it meant to be a star with the help of Marilyn Monroe. Jeffrey Mark will join us later on in this hour. We'll be able to stay tuned for that as well. In the meantime, Tony Figueroa and Donna Allen are with us as they make us this week in TV history. Tony's segment, as always, is brought to us by our friends at Story Salon, Southern California's longest-running, regularly performing live storytelling ensemble. For more information, storysalon.com, facebook.com forward slash Story Salon. What do you have for us tonight? March 4th, 1968, The Dick Cabot Show first aired. Dick Cabot, which airs on Get TV, if I remember correctly. Yes, it is showing. I believe you're right, Get TV. Uh, over the holiday season, I watched a few on Get TV when I was in Cincinnati. And uh, the two uh, that really was the first interview he did with Robin Williams. So you have to imagine this is Robin Williams right at the height of Mork and Mindy. So this had to be around, oh, 1978. And, and, and I think at yeah. that time, Dick Cavett was doing a show for oh, PBS. For PBS, yeah. Uh, Dick Cavett, I think I have a, a good breakdown here. ABC Daytime, March 4th, 1968 to January 24th, 1969. ABC Primetime, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, May 26th to September 19th, 1969. Uh, ABC Late Night, December 29th, 1969 to January 1st, 1975. Yeah, that that last show, he, I think he was the show they brought on to replace Joey Bishop when they canceled yes. Joey Bishop. And, and, and there were, remember, there was a brief period where you had Merv, Dick Cavett, and Johnny Carson. All yes. on late night. All on late wow. night. All competing against each other. All competing against each other. And they were all out of, uh, I believe, out of New York. Correct. I believe that's correct. And there was one night, unbeknownst to anybody else, Jerry Lewis did all three shows without the other two knowing. Ha! Huh. That because never they, happened today. Because they were not happen, shooting know. at the same time. Right, because Johnny, uh, Johnny and Merv, they would pre-tape theirs. In yeah, the, in the, and the Dick was evening. live. If you look at the proximity in New York where the three studios would be, in a Rockefeller Center, I guess uh, CBS they would have done it. Uh, to West 57th? Yeah. And uh, ABC? Would, uh, was was that, it in Times Square that at the time? That would be on, uh, I think that was either Times, yeah, like Avenue of the Star, Avenue of the yeah. Americas? Sixth, Sixth Avenue. Yeah. And, you know, uh, some of these shows they would do from a theater yeah. as opposed to a, a TV studio. Yeah. But somehow Jerry Lewis was able to appear on all three shows at the same night, and nobody knew that he was doing all three shows. Ha! Um the only time I know of something that happened in more recent history was during the writer's strike. Jimmy Kimmel appeared on with Jay Leno, and then Jay Leno appeared on Jimmy Kimmel's show, but that was a drive from Burbank to Hollywood and vice versa. Yes. But that they planned to do because yeah. they had no writers and they thought it would be a cool shtick uh, to do. Uh, so that's the only other time I could think of that. So, uh, yeah, PBS, October 10th, 1977 to October 8th, 1982. USA Network primetime, September 30th, 1985 to September 23rd, 1986. ABC Late Night, Tuesday and Wednesday night, September 22nd to December 3rd, 1986. 
I wonder if that was around the time they gave Jimmy Bresley the show. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. I, I think they did like a wheel. He, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Cavett was on twice a week, and Jimmy Breslin was on twice a week, and I forget what the year on yeah. Fridays. I think Jimmy Breslin resigned in the New York Post. I, Dear ABC, yeah. I, I I no longer require your services. Thank you. <laughs> and um, yeah, Jimmy Breslin, uh, who gained fame after Bernard Getz. Well, he was always local, but I no, think he, he got always, national. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think he was, um, oh, CNBC, April 17th, 1989 to January 26th, 1996, and TCM from 2006 to 2007. And within the last 10 years, he played the criminologist in the New York stage revival of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Really? Yes. Oh, my God. You can look him up on YouTube. That's so cool. Yeah. I always felt smarter and cool when I watched Dave Cavett. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Dick Cavett. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, he he was like Merv in the sense that he would have maybe not world leaders, but he would have subject matter that catered to a different demo that yes. Johnny was catering to. Definitely, yeah. Johnny kept things light. Johnny, the whole thing with Johnny, as David Letterman once put it, Johnny tucked you in at night. Yeah, which yeah. I think was the mission statement of the Tonight Show. Yeah, uh, remember- is it still the mission? I think it is with Jimmy. I remember Sigourney Weaver, the daughter of Pat Weaver, uh, during the whole controversy with Jay and Conan and everything was up in the air. She was hosting SNL. Yeah. And in lieu of her monologue, you know, a comedic monologue, she addressed the audience. She said, you know, my father created these shows. And really, I don't know if there's any sort of, sorry. Not to digress, there's no monument to Sylvester Pat Weaver. There should be something there because he created the Today Show, the Tonight Show, and many well, other. Well, there is in Steve Battaglia's book from yeah. yesterday to today, the history of the Today Show. Yeah, but there's there there's be... nothing in Rockefeller Center which a uh, bust or a plaque or. I think there should be a studio named after him. There should be a, he, his name should be on a building. If it's not, it should be. But she basically read his memo to the executives at NBC and basically this will be a show to close out the so people can end their days and it's going to be lighthearted and non-controversial so he basically had that as the mission statement that this is not going to be something that's going to be too heavy it's supposed to be light it's supposed to be fun entertaining and not controversial so that was the original mission statement of the tonight show whereas Dick Cavett's show I would say was sort of the precursor to what uh can Char- we say Charlie Rose? <laughs> I was, I, yeah. No, I was, I, was, I was almost hesitant, but no. Let's yeah. just, let's just yeah. say so Char- yeah. Charlie Rose. I yeah. mean, the one-on-one interview, in most cases, one guest for the entire 90 minutes. Uh, Charlie Rose did a 60-minute show, but Cabot did a 90-minute show when he when he first started yeah. in the late night. Dick and, Cabot worked with a live audience. Yeah. And Dick Cabot still had a monologue. And as and as you say, Donna, I mean, it was... it. It was, what's the word I'm looking for? It was, um, Cavett was an intellectual. And so yes. it was designed to not necessarily help you fall asleep, but to mm-hmm. kind of stimulate your, your, your thought. And you would have... And I'm sure sometimes he just put you to sleep. Yeah. Well, <laughs> depending yeah. on the guest. Yeah. Whereas the Tonight Show, and particularly the Johnny Carson Tonight Show, was to kind of help you unwind. Yeah. Whereas... Let's like make some fun in the monologue of what's happening in the day. Yeah. Which is, I mean, we said this a couple of years ago when we did a segment on Merv Griffin. Merv thrived better in daytime because yes. in daytime you're, you're, you're for the same reason why Oprah thrived in yes. daytime because you know three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon you're coming home from work or or you're you're more inclined to watch a lengthy sustained conversation with world leaders mm-hmm. or newsmakers and so forth whereas if you're accustomed to late night shows that are supposed to help you unwind and help you fall asleep you know uh you're you may not be geared to watch a one-on-one conversation with groucho Marx that you may that you have to stay up to one o'clock to watch because mm. you can't tape it and watch it the next day yeah true I got a, a box set of uh, the Dick Cavett show uh, talking to comedians. Uh-huh. So you had Grouch show. You had, and some of these are wonderful time capsules that just people like Grouch show, George Carlin, uh, 
just wonderful, wonderful interviews. One and I mentioned that we saw the Robin Williams. I remember when that first aired, I was uh, living in, uh, I, I was visiting my family in Puerto Rico, and it was on the local PBS station there. Mm -hmm. And Mork and Mindy had not shown there. So everybody heard about this phenomenon called Mork and Mindy and this incredible comedian named Robin Williams, but nobody had seen it there. You know, it would, you know when it would air, it would air dubbed in Spanish. So this is the first time uh, Dick Cavett's going to be on, and Robin. So my brother and I uh, stay up late to to watch it to see, you know, my brothers can see who this guy is, and my brother was in hysterics, just because seeing. But also, Dick Cavett could hold his own with Robin Williams, yeah. and not every talk show host. Most Johnny Carson just sur first of all Johnny Carson couldn't stop laughing when yeah. Robin would come on, Begin but he basically had to surrender. I give up. You could see, especially his first appearance on the Tonight Show. It's like everybody just gave up. Just keep the cameras on him. This is the best we can do. And it was you know especially young, cocaine out of his mind. Robin Williams, just have the cameras follow him yeah. and hope the censors don't have a cow. Yeah. And Dick Cavett was the first that could actually banter with Robin Williams when he was full blown Robin, uh, and uh, you know doing little bits and shtick and all that, improvising things like that. And he could just th he could he could pick up the ball and throw it back, mm -hmm. and throw hard. And and especially uh, with this show, you know you had this kind of living room set that Dick Cavett was based out of where you never thought about the fireplace or the potted fern or anything like that. And Robin is running around playing with anything that is na nailed down or not nailed down and then running up to the audience and, and, and then, you know, making fun of the crew and, and, all. and, and Dick is able to follow him. I don't think anybody else was ever able to do that with him. And it's so fun to watch him work with that and then to have like you said you know the intellectual conversation with yeah. Woody Allen or Groucho Marx yeah. um but yeah but Dick Cavett was great with all of that uh Merv yeah they were showing Merv on get uh on Martin Luther King Day yeah they, they had they, his they, Martin Luther King interview yeah and I think they still show Merv on Monday nights yeah and they had a couple but Martin Luther King Day they did one with uh Martin Luther King and then yeah. one with Bobby Kennedy mm -hmm. And, you know, I think a lot of times when people look back at Merv, they're thinking, ooh, yeah. or, you know, Merv pretending to be fascinated by what Jaja Gabor had to say, yeah. uh, which is its own talent, or Merv and Arthur Tre Treacher. Yeah. Mm. But to see him um, with Martin Luther King, first of all, they're not at the desk. Yeah. They have like two director's chairs in the middle and spotlight on them. And to ask these really intelligent questions. You could tell Merv read, read the newspaper. Yeah. Merv didn't just read Variety. And obviously, if you looked at his bank account, he obviously read the Wall Street Journal as mm -hmm. well. When you think about Merv was comparable to Donald Trump, if not more, uh, at the time. You know, buying casinos. But, but with substance. With substance, yes. The Thank thinking man's that. Trump. Yes. Yeah. So they're asking these questions. I mean, he probably was a billionaire. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> he could back it up and didn't brag about it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, he's making money off of Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. Yes. But, you know, to to have these really intelligent questions and to introduce, I would say, mainstream America, middle America, to who this man is. And then to open questions to the audience. And uh, you, you, you do a pan of the audience, you know, and have all these people throw questions at all the questions were respectful. And I think these questions represented questions that Americans had. Uh, but then to have uh, Dr. King, you know, politely answer all of these questions with some of them. Yeah, like I said, no, nobody personal attacks like what maybe Donahue would have later or, uh, or you know, Jimmy, uh, uh, Jerry Springer or something like that. Or but, uh, Morton Downey. Or Morton Downey, yeah. you know, zip it, zip it. Uh, but... They were asking questions about some of his beliefs, some of his philosophies, and you know we were still using words like Negro, uh, in to have these these people mostly. I think they were all white, you yeah. know, just and uh, different dialects from different regions of the United States, bringing these questions. And it was a civilized, intelligent conversation. I mean, uh, Merv was brilliant with that. Just before the Cavett show on 
uh, the late 1960s mm-hmm. Cabot Show, the one that succeeded Joey Bishop. ABC tried a weeknight national talk show with Les Crane. Now, Les Crane was mostly a local mm-hmm. talk show host. He started off at uh, KGO in San Francisco doing radio. Then he moved to New York and he did television. And he had a, quite a bit of fo- quite a following in the New York area doing late night. Uh, newsmakers, but they, and, and, and ABC gave him a, a Monday through Friday slot for about 13 months in the 1960s, and he had, um, a, 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 again, it was it was counter-programming, it was, it was trying to, to present something other than Johnny Carson, and it did not work because Johnny was in his height, and Johnny defeated a lot of challengers in his 30-year. You yeah. know, Alan Thick was around to ask; uh, he would tell you. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, but again, that was an early attempt to do what Cavett did mm-hmm. throughout the bulk of his career. But also, what you're mentioning goes back to a prior conversation. We were talking about local talent. Yeah. And, you know, Jerry Springer was a local show. Sally Jesse at Raphael was a local show. I'm concerned now because. We don't have the that look. We'll have a local news anchor that might be picked up by a bigger market, and yeah. then may go national. Yeah, and we may have Soledad O'Brien uh, who used to be on CNBC or yeah. MSNBC. She was originally a, an anchor at Carol in San Francisco. Yeah, or Joy Reid. Yeah, who's on MSNBC. I like, I like Joy, and mm-hmm. I, I think everybody loves Joy Reid. Yeah. She was uh, she was a local uh, reporter in Orlando yeah. and covered Trayvon Martin and got the national attention there and then moved up. But she still I think she still technically lives in Florida, uh, but she she does the show out of New York and she's been she's she's operated out of the Brokaw Center on on the West Coast as yeah. well. But yeah, I think the news anchors and reporters get the attention. That's basically how Brokaw eventually yeah. you know Brokaw was brought to do local in L.A. But he was covering. Um, I think when he was still, I think he was in Atlanta, and then if something happened overnight, it might have been faster to get Brokaw from Atlanta to cover the story, yeah. you know, just logistically. And then when he was in L.A., he was covering Governor Reagan's campaign, which made him uh, very well noticed on the national level and nightly news and the Today Show, I'm mean, Today Show, nightly news, all that. So, but. The other towns, the local talk show hosts and some of these other people that could have been staples in these markets, they would rather have, you know, uh, something syndicated yeah. than to have the local base show. And I get it because you could have Phil Jones, who was the biggest sweetheart of, you know, whatever city, Columbus, let's say. And if the choice was between Phil Jones or put on Ellen, guess who wins? It's it's going to be Ellen or Oprah. So I think a lot of these talents uh, don't exist like they used to. The local talents that not only would be there for the supermarket opening and be the grand marshal of the parade, but yeah, they're just not that that talent's not getting fostered anymore. That is a subject we should revisit at another time. Yeah. Channel Television at blogspot dot com, also storysalon dot com, Facebook dot com forward slash story salon. Donna is now the author of a four novel series called the fall again series which you can learn all about it's available at amazon.com where books are sold online as well as fall again series.com tony and don we'll see you both next time next, next time. time we'll play part two of our conversation with jeffrey mark next on tv confidential Ed Robertson, along with Tony Figaro and Donna Allen from Story Salon, Southern California's longest running regularly performing live storytelling ensemble which i understand is a new location yeah, we're very excited about it. We're moving, actually, to the Party Art Studio on Laurel Canyon Boulevard, 5302 Laurel Canyon. It's a new art gallery, and it's, it's been, beautiful. It's beautiful. Donna and I have been involved with Story Salon for the last nine-plus years. We're going to be in an art gallery now. We're going to have a $5 cover, some nice refreshments, and a wonderful, eclectic evening of storytelling. Which is a great environment because, it, 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 as you say, the word is eclectic, and for $5, it's a great evening of entertainment you can't ask for much more no not at all and uh, these stories some of them are funny some of them are tragic some of them are a little off the wall but we just have a wonderful time uh, keeping the art of storytelling alive 
And you can find out more about it by going to StorySalon.com. Accredited by Guinness World Records, welcome to Archival Television Audio, Incorporated. A peerless TV soundtrack archive, preserving the audio from television's first three decades, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the golden and silver age of television. For more information, go to atvaudio.com. One more, Adam, if you're planning a trip to Los Angeles this spring, be sure to stop by the world-famous Hollywood Museum, 1660 North Highland Avenue at Hollywood Boulevard, in the Max Factor building. Calendar year 2018 marks the 60th anniversary of Disney's Annette serials, the offshoot of the Mickey Mouse Club that not only made Annette Funicello a star, but in many respects paved the way for the movie of the week and the TV miniseries. With that in mind, the Hollywood Museum has put together a brand new exhibit this spring honoring Annette Funicello that includes many personal items of Annette's, including personal letters, awards, jewelry, wardrobe, dolls, games, props, original movie posters, a signed pair, a mouseketeer ears, and so much more. The Hollywood Museum is located at 1660 North Highland Avenue at Hollywood Boulevard in the Max Factor Building. For tickets and more information, call 323-464-7776, 323-464-7776, or go to the Hollywood Museum. Com. Hi, this is Loretta Swit, and you're listening to TV Confidential. Ed Robertson, welcoming you back to TV Confidential, radio talk show about television that is pleased to bring you part two of our conversation with Jeffrey Mark, author of Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald Centennial Birthday Edition, a comprehensive biography and discography of the First Lady of Song. In her lifetime, Ella Fitzgerald overcame poverty, homelessness, racial prejudice, sexual and physical abuse, and a slew of health issues to enjoy an astonishing music career that spanned seven decades, rivaling and in many ways surpassing those of Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, and Michael Jackson. Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, is available in hardcover through Ultimate Symbol. The deluxe edition of Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, includes a two-CD set with more than 40 studio and or live tracks of Ella Fitzgerald in her prime, all personally selected by Jeffrey Mark himself from all four of Ella's major recording labels, Decca, Verve, Capital, and Pablo Proceeds from the sale of the deluxe edition of Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, will be donated to the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation to further Ella's desire to help people of all races, cultures, and belief. To order Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, go to ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella. Okay, I want to talk about some of her uh, television appearances in just a second, but I want to go back to something that you said a few minutes ago about, I mean, one of the reasons why Ella is still revered all over the world is because she toured the world and she connected with audiences of all cultures, all creeds, all races. I mean, she loved everybody. And she knew that she was a role model to African Americans in particular because she was rising and became a star in the midst of segregation and the civil rights movement. One of the ironies, and it's I, I guess I don't know whether this, this is just the way it is or just part, part of the entertainment industry that happens sometimes, Ella did not favor African-American singers or white singers or white audiences or African-American audiences. Ever, Ella reached everybody. But some, I understand some African-American singers resented Ella because of her fame. So she had to deal with that. I don't blame them. I mean, if you're a female African-American singer, now, first of all, it is a shame that, that, that people even have to think this way. Yeah. Ella may be of her time, meaning the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. By the 1960s, things were easing up a little bit. 
and singers like Diana Ross and Diane Carroll weren't being compared only to other African American singers. They just became singers. But before that, if you were Carmen McRae or Sarah Vaughan or even Billie Holiday, you weren't, or Lena Horne, you weren't being compared to Doris Day or Dinah Shore or Judy Garland. You were being compared to Ella. And like I said earlier in our broadcast, there was Ella and there was everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're one of those everybody else's, there's going to be some, some feathers ruffled because you don't get to be appreciated for your own talent. You get to be appreciated in how you relate to the great Ella Fitzgerald. So it's, it's a shame people's mindsets were like that because Billy and Sarah and Carmen and Lena and, and everybody else have their own sound. They have their own talent. Do I think Ella was the best of all of them? Yes, I, I think there is a there is a mountaintop of female singers. Let's keep this to female, otherwise yeah. the, the the field becomes too large. Mm -hmm. But we'll put Mr. Sinatra up there also. Yeah. Of, of Barbara Streisand and Judy Garland and uh, Beverly Sills and Ella Fitzgerald, who really, 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 really were the best at the kind of music they sang. Maybe Ethel Merman on Broadway. They're the best. And it's an unfortunate thing people are going to be compared to them. Uh, at least today, when people are being compared, it's across the board racially, and it's across the board culturally. And you can say one is better than the other, but not because they're black or because they're not black. You're just comparing yeah. talent. Yeah. Uh, one thing that set Ella apart from pretty much any other female singer in her day, and I would say pretty much any other singer, period, with the possible exception of Sinatra, is that she was one of the few vocalists who could go from classic to contemporary, contemporary meaning even rock and roll, even pop songs, and still pull it off, still come across as cool. I mean, some people, there are, I mean, in fact, you have a few examples of this. In, in your book, Jeffrey, about uh, some peers of Ella who tried to switch genres and they came across looking ridiculous. Ella never had that problem. Ella could sing everything. Well, Ella was very wise about music. That, that's When you say someone's a genius, this is part of her genius. You know, if you go back to her, her foundation, where she started, literally, when, when Chick Webb hired her, he said, we're going we're gonna to go to Yale on Thursday. If the Yale boys like her, everybody will like her. And she was always very aware that it was young people who gave her her start, and she always wanted to make sure that she was never left behind. I said that a little earlier in the broadcast. Well, that included never being old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. So all through the years, when she first started... The music she sang, big band and that kind of swing music, was top 40 music. It was pop music of the day. As things changed and moved into rock and roll and folk music and rock music, Ella did not want to be left behind, and she didn't want her youthful listeners to be bored. Not that one can get bored yeah. with Gershwin, but unless one has heard Gershwin... Mm -hmm. It's a new thing. Mm -hmm. So she tried to include something contemporary. And uh, interestingly, she was the first person, the first singer, to realize that the Beatles weren't just some sort of terrible fad mm -hmm. taking record sales away from other people. She said, no, this is something new and it's good. And she recorded a big band version, a big band arrangement of Can't Buy Me Love. Mm -hmm. And she hit the top 40 with it. Yeah. She had a big hit with it. And in fact, Ringo Starr said, that's my favorite yeah. version of Can't Buy Me Love. Yeah. You, you, so she realized, aha, I can do this if I do it in my own style right. and don't try to copy their style. Yeah, be authentic. And yeah, so she recorded through the years John Lennon songs, Paul McCartney songs, 
uh, Carol Bayer Sanger songs, wonderful Melissa Manchester songs. Uh, she, she recorded a, an obscure Paul Williams song called Ordinary Fool. Mm -hmm. That's maybe the most brilliant uh, torch song of the last part of the 20th century and rescued it from obscurity. And I sing it in my show now because Ella sings it. And she sang it for the rest of her life. She, she kept adding things, uh, a medley of songs from the musical The Wiz, a Sunshine of Your Love, rock and roll songs, rock songs, but she sang them, Hey Jude, she sang them in her style. They weren't necessarily all big hits, but if you went to see her, it added another layer, another piece of texture to the tapestry of what was an Ella Fitzgerald experience. And as the music kept changing, she kept changing. The only thing she didn't try to do was rap music. Yeah. She felt if she tried that, she'd almost be making a parody of it. So she never did that. But she would drop even pieces of, like, what's love got to do with it mm -hmm. into her scatting to keep herself contemporary. And she always, every year, played colleges and universities and young people's festivals she was very much into young people she knew what it was like to be a young person with no future and very few options and she wanted to reach out to young people and tell them no you've got options look at me look what i've done you can do it too paul williams is one of the many 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 ella fitzgerald collaborators that Jeffrey Mark talked to in his excellent book, Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald Centennial Birthday Edition, which is available on hardcover through ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella. Okay, we before we started recording, I told you that being 50, I'll, I'll be 54 in March. And so I came of age, late 60s, early 1970s. I happened to watch my family happened to watch daytime television shows like Dinah and Mike Douglas. And, and for me, that was my introduction to Ella. And when she eventually started doing the Memorex commercials, I mean, to me, that she was part of, th that is how I came to know her. And as I got older, that's when I first discovered, and one of the joys of, your C of the CD you put together is you enable people like me who only knew older Ella you give us a chance to hear Ella in her prime. And there is the converse of that, which is there are people who are familiar with her songbooks or maybe Ella in Berlin, but don't realize that Ella had an album coming out every single year up mm -hmm. to 1990. Mm -hmm. But there is also this older Ella. It's a different voice, but she makes different choices because her voice changes. Uh, she uses everything she's got to bring you a wonderful experience. So it's, it's educational both ways. For those who only knew the older Ella, here's what she sounded like in her prime and, and in her youth. For those who only know that stuff, well, here's what she did when she got older, and here's how she adapted. So it's an educational process back and forth. It's a very funny thing. Now, here I am. I've written... What I think, and I hope those of you out there will also agree with me, a wonderful book and beautifully put together by Mies Hora at Ultimate Symbol. But I wasn't really aware of Ella until the 70s. Oh, I, I knew she was a singer, and I'd heard, I think, Lady Be Good from the 1940s, and I'd heard her gospel album. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, what she actually did, what she was known for, didn't connect in my head when I was a kid. And there was going to be an episode of Dinah, exclamation point. That was Dinah's <laughs> afternoon syndicated talk show. And Dinah was doing a salute to first ladies. Mm -hmm. So she had Beverly Sills, first lady of opera, and she had Lucille Ball, first lady of television. That's why I was watching. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth Taylor, first lady of movies, and Ella Fitzgerald, first lady of songs. And Ella came out and sang, I'm beginning to see the light from Duke Ellington. And Ordinary Fool. And I turned to the friend I was sitting with, and I, I guess in, in, in order to be totally honest, uh, I wasn't completely sober in the moment. I was a young man back yeah. then. Uh, I don't do those things anymore, but back then I imbibed a little bit. Yeah. And I sat there, 
and I said, she's not human. No one can do what she's doing because she was not singing the correct notes and she wasn't singing in the meter of the song, yet every note she sang was perfect and every meter she chose was the right choice. And I said, good heavens, I've got to find out more about this woman. That was in 1977. And I immediately started doing research. So my research has been a long time coming, up to including, you know, getting close to her office and her people and, and being a little part, a little part of uh, her later years career. It just blew me away. How can someone do what she did? I didn't understand. I knew what I was watching was genius and one of a kind. I didn't understand how she got there or where it came from. That's the germ of the book. And one of the cool things about uh, Jeffrey's book is he gives you an idea of what he calls the three essential Ella-isms, or Ella-ments, so to speak, you know, that made Ella different than anybody else. And you kind of touched on that in, in talking about the episode of Dinah that she that, that you watched her on in, in 1977 about how... She would do things like she would break up a syllable that shouldn't be broken up, or she would play with tempo, technically not sing it correctly, but she would sing it her way, and it would all sound seamless, and that's what made her an original. Yes. Those are technical things that she did. They can be, to some degree, copied, mm -hmm. but knowing when to do it, mm -hmm. not just how, yeah. but when and when not to when to sing it straight, when to bend it, when to change it up, and that she didn't do it the same way twice. So it wasn't like, this is how I sing. One of her favorite opening songs was Too Close for Comfort. Yeah. She did not ever sing it the same way twice. The arrangement was the same, but she sang it as she felt it in the moment, and she had the talent and this is the genius, to know what to do, when to do it, and when not to. Because we can point to different singers' techniques. Some singers, Bobby Darren snapped his fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, Ethel Merman had that, ah, uh, thing in her voice. Yeah. yeah, you can copy them. You can say that's a hallmark of their singing. But the genius is to know how to use it. And uh, there's so many levels and layers to what Ella did. That's why she's so different from everybody else. There are lots of wonderful, wonderful singers out there, and I've gotten to know many of them personally who I, I think are, are great, both in the jazz field and in the pop field. And, you know, rock, Janis Joplin was mm -hmm. a genius. Mm -hmm. But Ella had so many layers to what she did, even in later years when her voice was more limited. That's why she stands alone. We're talking to Jeffrey Mark, author of Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald Centennial Birthday Edition, a comprehensive biography and discography of the First Lady of Song. In her lifetime, Ella Fitzgerald overcame poverty, homelessness, racial prejudice, sexual and physical abuse, and a slew of health issues to enjoy an astonishing music career that spanned seven decades, rivaling and in many ways surpassing those of Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, and Michael Jackson. Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, is available in hardcover through Ultimate Symbol. The book includes 275 photographs, many of which are in color, plus a complete discography, videography, and more. To order the book, go to ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella. How did Ella first start doing the commercials for Memorex? Well, like anything else, when you're doing anything commercial like that, a company contacts your agents or the people who represent you. Most big stars have somebody who, like, this is the person you call if you want to use Ella for something commercial. I have one, too. I mean, everybody who works in sure. show business has someone like yeah. this, should they want to use you. And it was a genius idea. And it's the truth, because they had three attorneys there for every commercial she did. 
the idea, for those of you out there who don't know what we're talking about, all through the 1970s into the 1980s, Memorex was a company, and still is, but back then their big deal was that they made cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. And that they were saying their cassette tapes captured sound and music so well that you can't tell if it's someone singing live or if it's Memorex playing their voice back. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they got a glass blower. And this is a scientific thing. That glass can be blown so that if a certain musical note is hit purely and clearly, very, very loud, <laughs> it will shatter the glass. So they would tell Ella what note, and they would make this glass to that note. And all of them, because nobody ever hears this part, it says the amplified voice of Ella Fitzgerald yeah. can shatter glass. And she'd hit the note, live in front of the camera, the glass would be in front of the speaker, and crack when she hit the note. Then they'd play the tape back, and again, the glass would crack. And at first it was just Ella, it was Ella and Count Basie, it was Ella and Chuck Mangione, it was Ella and Melissa Manchester, but the constant was that Ella could hit this note, and is it Ella or Memorex? And Ella would say, beats me, <laughs> and tell you how much money... So she was known, she said, there are people who didn't know that she sang other than, ooh, ooh, there's the Memorex lady. That's right. She'd go to London, and the little Cockney children, oh, look, it's the Memorex lady. <laughs> Everywhere she went, even in Japan, she didn't understand, but she understood the word Memorex, mm -hmm. and they'd point at her. Yeah. It opened her up to a whole new generation of people who maybe wouldn't have known who she was otherwise. You know, it, it, it's interesting, Jeffrey. Uh, she appeared on pretty much every major variety show of the 50s, 60s, going into the 70s. Uh, she appeared on The Tonight Show under, you know, uh, Johnny, under Jack Parr, under Steve Allen. I mean, she did a lot of television, yet she never was offered a show of her own. And I was just thinking about this before before I called you today. And you go into the reasons why she probably wasn't offered a show at the time, but my guess is even if she were offered her own show, I don't think she would have taken it because she was so much in demand on the road and she made a lot more money on the road. I, don't, I think tele, a, a weekly television show would have slowed her down. Perhaps. Uh, unfortunately, I think we have to go back to who our country was half a century ago. Mm -hmm. The only person African-American, who even tried to have a variety show of his own, was Nat King Cole. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1957, and Ella and everybody else in show business appeared on the show almost for free just to get this thing going. And they were able to maintain about a year, but it was a huge flop, and a lot of stations around the country wouldn't carry it because there was a black man and a sexy black man singing romantic songs, and they weren't going to have it. But what is, I think, a bigger thing, yeah, the weekly show, probably not, because she was working so hard, but that Ella did television specials, four or five of them for the BBC. Mm -hmm. She did them in Sweden. She did them in Germany. She did them in France. She did, them, she did live concert television shows in the south of France, about a half a dozen of them, she did four or five of them in Japan. American Network Television, and I know I'm aging myself here because I'm even older than you are. Uh, <laughs> uh, NBC, ABC, CBS were the only networks we had up until cable. Mm -hmm. Never gave Ella Fitzgerald a television special. They would never allow a black female to have her own show. The first African American to have his own variety show like that after Nat Cole, was Flip Wilson. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ella did one special with uh, the Duke Ellington Orchestra, and that was syndicated, meaning it played in individual stations around the country mm -hmm. at different times. Mm -hmm. She's this iconic, number one, Grammy-winning performer, and yet the different networks never thought she was important enough or could sell her enough to even give her a special never mind her own series. She did end up doing two things for PBS in 1979. 
But everywhere else in the world, there were all these wonderful Ella Fitzgerald specials, and I'm grateful that I have copies of all of them, so I can watch them. And uh, if you go on to uh, Amazon.com today, there are several European specials you can buy on DVD, which is just the way Ella would want it, that we can, in the 21st century, stick a disc in or stick a fire stick in Mm. or turn through the YouTube or through the Internet, and we can still watch Ella in concert today. Ella would just love that, that we can still be enjoying what she felt she was born to do. And we hope you're enjoying part two of our conversation with Jeffrey Mark, author of Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald. We'll take a quick time out, then we'll talk some more about Ella Fitzgerald, including how she learned to be a star for the first time with the help of Marilyn Monroe after this quick time out here on TV Confidential. Ham Cam Caricatures will keep the fun rolling at your next party, convention, or event through a live video feed. As friends or colleagues gather around the webcam, I can see them on my screen, and they can view my caricatures come to life on their own screen. (laughs) A completed black and white drawing will then be emailed to you to print out. Pricing and details are at hamcamcaricatures.com. That's H-A-M-M-C-A-M-C-A-R-I-C-A-T-U-R-E-S dot com. Buying or selling a home can be one of the most stressful things we'll ever do in life. But it doesn't have to be. And no one knows better than our friends at Front Porch Realty Group. Their community of realtors serving the Northern Bay Area of California that cares about their clients as individuals first and foremost. Whether you're a first time buyer or looking to lease or sell your property in the Bay Area, Front Porch Realty Group will help you through this important transition by providing you with the right information for your situation while lessening the pain. They also work with a network of realtors throughout California who provide the same high caliber of customer service. Call Front Porch Realty Group at 415-886-7411 for a realtor referral near you. You can also visit their website, frontporchrealtygroup.com, for more information on the services they provide, including upcoming workshops and seminars. For more information, call 415 886-7411 or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com Front Porch Realty Group They'll find the solution that works best for you. Ed Robertson here to tell you how you can get a free first ride with Uber the mobile app that connects you with the ride at the touch of a button in just a matter of minutes. Uber has drivers in cities across the country and around the world while payment is seamless and cashless. To download the app go to uber.com and enter the promo code TVCONFIDENTIAL all one word, and you will receive a free first ride up to $20. To sign up directly with the promo code included, go to get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential. Get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential. If you've listened to TV Confidential and like what you've heard, please consider supporting our efforts by becoming a patron of our show through Patreon. It's easy to do and costs as little as a dollar a month. For more information, go to patreon.com forward slash TV Confidential or click the Patreon button on the homepage at tvconfidential.net. Hi, this is Don Wells. Guess what we're listening to? TV Confidential. Be wise, be smart. He's too close for comfort. Ed Roberts with a reminder that we will play part two of our conversation with actor, director, and author Lou Antonio in our second hour. We hope you'll stay tuned for that. In the meantime, our guest this hour is Jeffrey Mark. Jeffrey Mark, Emmy Award winning and Grammy Award nominated writer, producer, performer, author, and show business rack on tour. Jeffrey's latest book, Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald Centennial, Birthday edition is available in hardcover through ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella, ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella. One of the fun things uh, I learned in the book is in many respects, she found a kindred spirit in Marilyn Monroe. Tell our listeners about that. Well, sure. Ella, it's a funny thing. And this is a compliment to Ella, but it's also an, an unusual fact. There is something in Ella's voice that seems to 
to soothe the savage breast. Mm-hmm. Meaning, people with mental illness issues, people with neuroses, and then we know this from very famous people who have shared this, mm-hmm. that when, when they got stressed out, when they were depressed, when they felt the world was against them, they would retreat to their mansion, apartment, hotel room bed and put on Ella Fitzgerald singing ballads and it soothed their soul. Mm -hmm. I have seen this happen with animals and you're thinking I'm going to say it because I've written this book. I have put on Ella singing ballads and had cats and dogs perk up, walk over to the speaker her voice was coming out of, cuddle up next to it, Mm -hmm. lie down, and just relax listening to Ella. There's something in that God-given voice. Marilyn Monroe was one of these people. So wherever Ella was, if Marilyn happened to be in the same city, Marilyn came and saw her, and they became friends. Well, Marilyn was nobody's fool, and certainly most of what's been written about her does not do the human being justice. Mm -hmm. She knew, Marilyn did, her star power, and she knew what she could do with that. Ella did not. Ella still, maybe never, realized the esteem in which she was held and how big a star she was. And Ella, in the 1950s, was still having problems, getting booked into the finest nightclubs, and even being able to walk into the front door of the very club or concert hall in which she was appearing. Marilyn knew this. And in one club, turned to them and said, listen, I hear you're you know, not looking to book Ella. Here's what I will do. I will come in every night. I will reserve a table of 10 and bring you 10 celebrities who will eat and drink, and you can publicize who's coming every single night of her appearance, and you will get a full packed house because of us. And they did, and she did, and Ella never had trouble getting booked in a high-class nightclub again. There was a place in Denver. Marilyn happened to be there. Ella was performing, and uh, they were going to go in before Ella's performance. The press was there, but the place did not want Ella Fitzgerald to walk in the front door. And Marilyn Monroe turned to them and said, you got two choices, kids. I walk in the front door arm and arm with Ella Fitzgerald, and that's your photo opportunity for publicity, or neither one of us walks in at all. Well, naturally, they let them in the front door. But Ella observed Mm -hmm. what Marilyn did. Ella never played the diva, but Ella began to demand first-class travel and better arrangements and nicer dressing rooms. When I say arrangements, I don't mean musically. I mean arrangements, how she was treated in her personal appearances. She never was as forward as Marilyn was. She didn't cut through the way Marilyn did, but she made sure her representatives made sure that from that point forward she got first-class treatment because she observed the power Marilyn had and realized, and and this matured her as a human being, Mm -hmm. aha, I can demand better treatment. And that's when Ella really also began to get involved with the civil rights movement. Okay, all right, now I am in a position to open doors for other people. Now I'm in a position to support Dr. Martin Luther King. Now I can demand that other black performers, any place I play, also get treated the same way I do. There were lots of people who claim in their autobiographies they were the ones who kicked the doors in. Ella precedes most of them. Final question for now, Jeffrey, because I have a feeling uh, I'm going to want you back on my program one of these days. But final question for now, what did you learn about Ella Fitzgerald that surprised you the most? 
oh, good heavens, that, you know that nobody's ever asked me that question before? And by the way, may I give you a compliment, sir? Uh, as, as your listeners probably know, when you write a book, or just if you're a celebrity being interviewed, uh, people kind of look through your book, or they look at the pictures, or they read a press release, and that's how you're asked questions. You've obviously read the entire book. You're very knowledgeable about what I've done, and I really appreciate that, and I'll come on your show any time because of that. Awesome. So, so please know that, Ed. Listeners, uh, you've got a good guy here. Enjoy him, and let, your, let people out there know to listen to Ed because his show is marvelous. I am... We are like 45 times past the amount of time I said I do. <laughs> I'm having a great time with Ed. And tell your friend to listen to Ed. He's wonderful. Uh, what I learned most about her probably that surprised me was her childhood. That uh, there's nothing in any of her publicity uh, other than, well, she was an orphan. And the original publicity said that Chick Webb adopted her until she became 18, which is horse hockey. Yeah the real story of what happened to her. Uh, And it's a story of physical violence and rape and torture, literal torture. Uh, It's a story of living on the streets. It's a story of being literally unwashed, unfed, in tattered clothing. And look what she took from that and became this person where it's Ella and nobody else, or Ella and everybody else, that it's heartbreaking. I can relate to it. Unfortunately, as a child, I was the recipient of some of that treatment. And maybe we're kindred spirits, she and I, because on paper, Ella and I should have slashed our wrists years and years ago and been nothing. Instead, Ella chose life. Over and over, when she had adversity, you can choose to be a victim and lay back and cry, or you can choose to be a winner and live and push forward. And I've done that in my life as well. I don't often say this, but I'll say it for your broadcast. There was a period in my life where I had problems with alcohol and drugs. And April 1st, I'll be clean and sober 29 years. Happy birthday. Thank you, sir. Nobody out there who's listening to my voice, if you don't want to drink anymore or drug anymore, you don't have to. And if you are being mistreated out there, you don't have to be. And Ella decided she didn't have to be. And I decided I didn't have to be. And that, to me, is the mark of a hero. Not me, Ella. Ella is a hero. Ella is a hero, a genius hero who kicked doors down, pushed adversity aside, and said, no, I'm here, and I'm going to prevail. And if you're a genius and you say that, there is no choice other than to succeed. And look what she did with her life and the legacy that in in her later years she supported... Um, a children's center in Watts in Los Angeles with only her own personal money, just Ella's money, Mm -hmm. supported the Center for Children. And today there is the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation. Look it up on your Internet and give money to it. All of my concerts around the country are benefits for them, helping working-class people who are up against it. You've just lost your job. Your car just died. You can't afford your kids' tuition anymore, and it helps people. She always wanted to take what she got and helped others to grow the way she did. What a one! besides all that music, what a wonderful legacy. Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, is available in hardcover through Ultimate Symbol. The book includes 275 photographs, many of which are in full color, plus a complete discography, videography, and a whole lot more. Uh, The deluxe edition of Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, includes a two-CD set with more than 40 studio and or live tracks of Ella Fitzgerald in her prime, all personally selected by Jeffrey Mark 
himself. Proceeds from the sale of the deluxe edition of Jeffrey's book will be donated to the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation. To order Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, go to ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella, ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella. To follow the adventures of Jeffrey Mark, go to facebook.com forward slash Jeffrey Mark, correct? Correct, sir. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to our next conversation. I do, too, Ed. You're marvelous at what you do, and I cannot wait to be on again. Greg Airbar will join us at the top of the hour for a brand-new DVD report. Then we will play part two of our conversation with actor, director, screenwriter, and author Lou Antonio. All that more coming up in hour number two of TV Confidential. Stay with us. If you haven't been listening to TV Confidential... This is who you're missing. Shirley Jones. Diane Baker. Bobby Hall. Channing Chase. Charlene Chilton. Cherie J. Wilson. David Franco. Peggy King. Shelley Morrison. Karen Condition. Joanne Worley. And many, many more of your favorite celebrities and people behind the scenes in the world of television. That's TV Confidential. Every week on this station and every day online at tvconfidential.net. This portion of TV Confidential is brought to us by our friends at Front Porch Realty Group the community of realtors in the Northern Bay area of California that is committed to finding the solution that is best for their clients. Whether you're a first-time home buyer or looking to sell or lease your property in Northern California, call 415-886-7411 or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com for more information on how they can help you. Hi, this is Michelle Nichols, and you're listening to TV Confidential. Ed Roberts with a reminder that we will play part two of our conversation with Luke Antonio later on in this hour. We hope you'll stay tuned for that. In the meantime, Greg Airbar is with us for another look at recently released DVD titles that we think you'll find of interest. Greg covers music, film, and television releases both on DVD and for streaming on demand for CartoonResearch.com, AnimationScoop.com, LeonardMolton.com, GregAirbar.com. Greg, what do you have for us tonight? A couple of Saturday morning shows, uh, one from Hanna-Barbera and one from Filmation. Uh, let's start with the, the serious one. That would be Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle from Filmation, one of their best shows. And I know we talk about Filmation a lot on this, and I tend to be a filmation apologist um, because a lot of their shows are good, and there's a tendency to look down on their animation as cheap and stilted. But actually, Tarzan Lord of the Jungle was one of their their first ones to use rotoscoping, which is a process that Max Fleischer invented back in the 30s, maybe the late 20s, where they take live action footage and they trace over it so that a human figure can look more realistic in animation and that's what they they did it in snow white and pinocchio as well the figure of tarzan who is walking or swinging on his vine they used it in the batman series a little bit but uh, there was extensive use of it here um, and because filmation would stock their animation they could reuse this footage there was a lot of very good animation and the cool thing about it is that this is uh, known as being one of the most faithful adaptations of the Burroughs Tarzan, uh, based on directly from the books. I mean, if you look at the titles of the shows, they almost read like the titles of some of the movies. You know, City of Gold, uh, The Golden Lion, Forbidden City, Graveyard of the Elephants, The Land of the Giants. I mean, these are, these are very much like the titles of the books. And uh, to those who don't know the Tarzan books uh, or movies terribly well... A lot of people think that Tarzan speaks in that stilted Johnny Weissmuller Tonto uh, way of speaking, but actually he was Lord Greystoke and he spoke clearly. And on this series, and perhaps for the first time on TV, he spoke clearly. And the voice of Robert Ridgely, who was a character actor who physically looked nothing like Tarzan. It was a sort of a doughy guy. Yeah, just, just as Ulan Soleil looked physically nothing like Batman and half the superheroes he voiced. Yes, yeah, he looked like your, your friendly um, insurance salesman yes. or banker. It, it was a, a very straightforward, 
very seriously done show. It had its humor in it, but it didn't have a lot of the trappings that were added to the films. It didn't have Boy. I didn't have Jane, but there was um, Tantor. If you saw the Disney film, uh, The Elephant. Um, if you know your filmation sound effects, when you hear Tantor trumpet, that's the same elephant effect you hear in Journey Back to Oz. So it's sort of nostalgic for those of us who, who know that. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I correct myself. Tarzan and Jane uh, are in there. Linda Gary is the voice of Jane, who uh, you remember from the He-Man series. She played Tila. And so she is in there, but she's not constantly in it. She's only in it once, actually. We have a lot of characters who we don't see all the time in in the films. So you also have some of these wonderful actors who did appear later. Alan Oppenheimer, who was most famous as the voice uh, for Filmation, as the voice of Skeletor. And he plays a lot of villains. And you can hear sort of the larval stages of his Skeletor voice coming through in some of the villains. A lot of fun adventures and a lot of messages because Filmation was also known to have messages in all of the stories. And then the series was so successful and so well regarded that it, it lasted uh, after the 16 episodes that are on this DVD. It went into the Batman and Tarzan Adventure Hour, then Tarzan and the Super 7. And I'm hoping that they uh, they continue because they, were, they, they went for about six seasons. Um, some of them are reruns, but there are more than this. So it'd be nice if they keep doing it. I don't know if they will because it's been quite a while, but I'd love to see Warner Archive pick them up. It's a good quality series. It's a good quality series, and clearly, e even though the Warner Archives release a lot of its tiled manufacture on demand, which is a very smart way uh, to go about it these days, they print sets as they are ordered or as they are manufactured on demand. But I might be wrong, but it seems to me they would not be releasing these titles, not only Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, but some of the other many of the other filmation titles that we've been talking about, if they had not identified uh, an audience that wants these titles. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't release the product unless you know there's an audience to buy it. That's true, but the Warner Archive seems to pick up a lot of titles for second and third seasons that uh, weren't as big sellers in the mainstream sell that Warner was selling in stores. So there's always that possibility because uh, there's 36 total episodes of this. One little piece of trivia also is the famous Tarzan yell that Carol Burnett does so well. And can still do it even at 80-something. Yes, yes, she did it on the recent special. Yeah. That you were there for. You saw her do it live. I right? was. I did, I, I did see it live, yes. And it wasn't dubbed. It was her live doing it. It was her live doing it. I can, I can vouch for that. Well, on the TV series, it's none other than producer Lou Scheimer. Of course. The yell. <laughs> Lou, Lou, Lou Scheimer, we've said this before. We mean this in the best possible light. He was sort of like the utility player. By design to a, to a degree because filmation is often knocked for doing things inexpensively or doing things within budget. But Lou Scheimer being a smart guy, I mean, and obviously a talented guy, because if if he couldn't do the voices, he would he would have hired somebody. But the fact is, he was talented enough to do the voices, and 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 therefore you're, you're able to keep things within budget. And he was not shy about saying it was cheaper. He said, "I don't have to pay anybody when it's me." So it wasn't like he was he was pretentious about, "Oh no, this is I'm a." great thespian he would say no they sometimes they would use electronics to make it this or that but that definitely was him that's pretty impressive any extra features to speak of if you have not already mentioned them no unfortunately on this particular one some of the filmation releases have them but on this one it is not and this one's released by warner as we said but not archive that this is regular warner okay regular warner brothers home entertainment but from Warner Archive does come one of my favorite Hanna-Barbera series, and one that I suspect they may have pitched as primetime or for syndication. It's a series that not everybody remembers. It's called The Roman Holidays. And it was a basically it was basically the Flintstones only in ancient Rome. And it was the, the when, holidays when, that was the name of the family. When did this air? This was in around nineteen seventy three. 72, 73. I have no recollection of it. Many people do not. <laughs> I'm in good company then. But I, I loved it. 
and I have to, uh, I'm proud of the fact that when the actress who played uh, Lori Holiday, who was the mom, that was the wonderful character actress Shirley Mitchell, who, uh, gosh, she she did tons of radio. She played uh, one of Lucy Ricardo's friends uh, on, uh, on I Love Lucy. She was on this show, and it was one of the few times she got to play a lead on a Hanna-Barbera cartoon, where she was in town in L.A. doing a voiceover session that I was at, and when she came out, I sang the entire theme song to her in the parking lot. Um, and she was flabbergasted and thoroughly delighted and in no way frightened. So I was very proud of that moment. Well, um, it I, was... <laughs> I, I, just, I just looked it up. It aired 71 to 72, and obviously I was not watching NBC during that year. <laughs> well, it was also on NBC practically buried very early in the morning, unless it was just my local station that put it on around 8 a.m. in the morning. And so it was... It, you know, it was it was hidden. I mean, you wouldn't even know it existed. And yet it, it had the voice of Don Beloise. He played Mr. Evictus, the uh, landlord who uh, was naturally angry all the time. And then you had Gus, who was Augustus, who was Dave Willock, another character actor who rarely got to play the lead. He was the narrator of the Wacky Races and another character actor who was in every 60s sitcom pretty much that anybody saw and uh, stanley livingston from my three sons played a happiest happy holiday and the glorious pamela and Ferdin, uh was precocia holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh dawes butler was brutus their pet lion and he was great because it was sort of like a snaggle push. You know, he would say, growl, growl. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was adorable. And, and then uh, Sherry Alberoni, who was the voice, she was a mask, former musketeer. She was, uh, Sherry Alberoni, who was on our program uh, one or two years prior to this. Yes, she was Alexandra on Josie and the Pussycats. Yeah. She was Wendy, uh, the, one of the Wonder Twins on Super Friends. Well, she had, she had the best name of all. She was Hap's girlfriend, Ruvia. <laughs> well, this is the is this is nineteen seventy one. Absolutely. So it was it was typical sitcom stuff, you know. Again, going to the prom. Who's going to date who for the teenagers? Willie loses job. There, I think that's probably why it was short lived. They, they didn't they didn't do anything terribly innovative with the stories. You know, uh, Gus can't go to work, so. Laurie glues a mustache on and pretends to be him. I mean, that kind of stuff. It wasn't like they were breaking new ground in, in animation or anything. But still, if you're a Hanna-Barbera fan and you love these voice actors, you know, because it's the who's who, and, and you love that kind of Hanna-Barbera, you know, the background music by Hoyt Curtin, the uh, catchy theme song with all the trumpets, it's just loads of fun. D don't expect... Uh, a life-changing revelation experience and, you know, the the sun that comes shining through. It's just loads of fun. Roman Holidays, available yep. in its entirety through Warner Archive. Yes, I think I've said everything I can except singing the theme song and I will spare you, Ed. Yes, it, this being a Hanna-Barbera production, it has a theme song, which you can, but you'll have to purchase Roman Holidays or at least sample Roman Holidays in its entirety through our friends at Warner. Archive, animationscoop.com, cartoonresearch.com, leonardmalton.com, gregairbard.com. Greg, we'll see you again soon. Well, on behalf of myself and Groovia, I thank you, Ed. We'll play part two of our conversation with Lou Antonio next on TV Confidential. Buying or selling a home can be one of the most stressful things we'll ever do in life, but it doesn't have to be. And no one knows better than our friends at Front Porch Realty Group. Their community of realtors serving the Northern Bay Area of California that cares about their clients as individuals first and foremost. Whether you're a first-time buyer or looking to lease or sell your property in the Bay Area, Front Porch Realty Group will help you through this important transition by providing you with the right information for your situation while lessening the pain. They also work with a network of realtors throughout California who provide the same high caliber of customer service. Call Front Porch Realty Group at 
7411 for a realtor referral near you. You can also visit their website, frontporchrealtygroup.com, for more information on the services they provide, including upcoming workshops and seminars. For more information, call 415-886-7411 or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com. Front Porch Realty Group. They'll find the solution that works best for you. Missed a show? We have more than 250 archived editions of TV Confidential available as digital downloads. For more information, go to shop.tvconfidential.net, shop.tvconfidential.net. One more, Adam, if you're planning a trip to Los Angeles this spring, be sure to stop by the world-famous Hollywood Museum, 1660 North Highland Avenue at Hollywood Boulevard in the Max Factor building. Calendar year 2018 marks the 60th anniversary of Disney's Annette serials, the offshoot of the Mickey Mouse Club that not only made Annette Funicello a star, but in many respects paved the way for the movie of the week and the TV miniseries. With that in mind, the Hollywood Museum has put together a brand new exhibit this spring honoring Annette Funicello that includes many personal items of Annette's, including personal letters, awards, jewelry, wardrobe, dolls, games, props, original movie posters, a signed pair, a mouseketeer ears, and so much more. The Hollywood Museum is located at 1660 North Highland Avenue at Hollywood Boulevard in the Max Factor Building. For tickets and more information, call 323-464-7776, 323-464-7776, or go to the Hollywood Museum. Com. Ed Robertson here to tell you how you can get a free first ride with Uber, the mobile app that connects you with the ride at the touch of a button in just a matter of minutes. Uber has drivers in cities across the country and around the world, while payment is seamless and cashless. To download the app, go to uber.com and enter the promo code TV Confidential, all one word, and you will receive a free first ride up to $20. To sign up directly with the promo code included, go to get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential, get.uber.com, forward slash go, forward slash TV Confidential. Hi, this is Jacqueline Smith. You're listening to TV Confidential. Ed Robertson, welcoming you back to TV Confidential, a radio talk show about television that is pleased to bring you part two of our conversation with actor, director, screenwriter, and author Lou Antonio. As a stage actor, Lou has performed in more than 70 plays, including the works of Tolstoy, Shakespeare, Bertolt Brecht, Tennessee Williams, Garson Kanan, and Edward Albee. Plus, he has acted and directed in more than 200 hours of television. Lou's book, Cool Hand Lou, My 50 Years in Hollywood and on Broadway, is a memoir of his life and career as an actor, screenwriter, and director that also serves as an homage to the many teachers who graced his life one way or another throughout his career, including Lee Strasberg, Eli Wallach, Elia Kazan, Leonard Nimoy, and Art Carney, plus great stories about playing softball with George C. Scott, the time he dressed Elizabeth Taylor without her realizing it, and what to do when a crew member drops dead in the middle of a TV production. Lou, cool Hand Lou is available in softcover and as an ebook through our friends at McFarland Books. You can also order it by calling 800 253 2187, 800 253 2187, or go to McFarlandPub.com if you want an autographed edition of Cool Hand Lou. From Lou Antonio himself, you can contact Lou through his website, louantonio.com. Um, I was told that David Jansen was one of the quickest studies ever. Well, he and Jim and um, Mr. Gunsmoke. Uh, James Arness. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, I, I just, uh, I mean, both of them. Well, David was just such a kind of a, uh, really a humble Easy to talk to guy. I mm -hmm. mean, just you know, you want to hang out with him. And the big guy, James you know, Arness. Arness. James Arness. Yeah. He had been doing the gunsmoke for so long that they would they would write it so that he would work one day mm -hmm. per episode. And uh, that's why in so many of the later when they became a one hour show, so many of the episodes you'd you'd see him getting on his horse and saying to Doc or Festus, 
well, I got to go into Dead Rock and uh, settle <laughs> something over there first. <laughs> then he'd come back and thirst us in Doc would entertain us for a whole hour anyway. But, and, and I say I might have written about it, I'll make it quick. Uh, I was doing, I was playing a bad guy and I had a scene in jail, three pages with RNS. And he comes, he never read the script, why would he? Uh, and he, he came in, read the script, had the script in his hand, the pages, just the pages. And we read it once. And it was lit, and and uh, not even another rehearsal. One, he read the three pages in one time, and memory had it right there. He had mm-hmm. it word for word. And uh, Jansen was, I, I never, Jansen just always seemed to know his lines. Yeah. I mean, he was just an easy guy to be with. Jim just wanted to get the hell out of there. Mm-hmm. But th- th- he had, luckily he had that kind of part. He worked hard to get to that part. And a nice man. And I, a good joker, too. Loved his jokes. Yes. But Jansen was just easy going, uh, knew he had limitations. I did a whole bunch of fugitives with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, the very first one, uh, when it was in black and white, if you all can remember. Yes. Black and white. Yes. Uh, and he was, even then, just as easy going and glad to be on a set, having a good time, and having a beer afterwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, just. I don't know how he did that. I never, never saw him blow or forget a line or anything. Yeah, I, I was I mean, really. It's like he was uh, in your front room chatting with you. Yeah, I, I, I was, I, I was told he also had a great sense of humor. Was was very good at keeping everybody loose. And um, just, just to show a contrast, I was, I was told that he was the type of actor. He didn't just read his lines. He read the entire script. So he, he understood the totality of what he was doing and what your character was doing when you had a one-on-one scene with him. And also, uh, you just remind me, some actors uh, in movie, well, some just some actors, uh, big shots, uh, they'll do their close-up, and then uh, we'll say, uh, look, um, Lou, is it okay? Uh, I really just uh, got to make a phone call. Uh, can you have somebody else do the off-camera? Oh, yeah, sure. Mr. Starr? <laughs> <laughs> Not David. Yes. David was always there to do uh, his off-camera lines for you. Always. Never never once shirked his responsibility as an actor to another actor. It was just wonderful. Yeah, and you've got you, you've got a great story about Jansen, I think if, if it's the one I'm thinking of, where he was not only generous in that way, he was generous towards his guest actors. If he was doing close-ups, if it was a close-up where he was supposed to play off of you, he would say, okay, Lou, you take a break so you can prepare yourself for the next scene, and I'll run, I'll run my lines with somebody else, so that way you can prepare. Yes, and, and can I tell you the line is, he said, why? Go ahead. I was okay to do that. Go ahead. Because, <laughs> okay. I mean, my, my jaw dropped when he said that. Yeah. But, but then he said, uh, Lou, um, I, I, I'm perfectly comfortable if you if you want to do your lines, but you don't have to because it, it, Mary Ellen, the script supervisor, usually just reads them, and it's not going to make any difference who reads the lines off camera. It's not going to make any difference to me. So just go ahead, t- go t- take a break. In other words, he soon he so knew what he was going to do mm-hmm. and was so confident in it, he could have done it. Without anybody cooing and maybe just pointing a finger for the next line. Yeah. He had that kind of skill. Yeah. And it was the simplest. He, he was always honest and authentic when you acted with him because he was that way as a person. He really was an authentic. Uh, I, I, and certain things I cannot tell you, uh, but uh, he was just right there. As really sitting around having a beer. Mm-hmm. Our guest this hour is Lou Antonio. Lou's book, Cool Hand Lou, My 50 Years in Hollywood and on Broadway, is a memoir of his life as an actor and director that is also filled with great stories about working alongside Paul Newman, Elizabeth Taylor, Carol Burnett, Ken Basinger, Dennis Weaver, David Jansen, Henry Fonda, Jacqueline Smith, Keith Ledger, Louis Gossett Jr., Renee Zellweger, Lee Remick, Lawrence Olivier, Julie Harris, James Garner, and others too numerous to mention. Cool Hand Lou is available in soft cover and as an ebook through our friends at McFarland Books. You can order it by calling 800 
800-253-2187 or go to mcfarlandpub.com. If you want an autograph edition of Cool Hand Lou from Lou Antonio himself, you can contact Lou through his website, louantonio.com. Oh, but we also have to thank Jacqueline Smith. Oh, we, oh, we, we, definitely, have to, uh, we, we definitely have to thank Jacqueline Smith. Jacqueline Smith paved the way for Lou Antonio being on our program tonight, so we definitely want to thank her for that. There's a great story. We're not going to tell it on the air. We have, you have to, uh, there's a great story involving, uh, uh, how, how should I put it? Lou teaching Jacqueline Smith how to perform a love scene. That's all we'll say. In order to in, 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 in order to find out, you got to pick up a copy of Lou's book, which is Cool Hand Lou: My Fifty Years in Hollywood and on Broadway, which you can order directly from Lou himself, LouAntonio.com. That's called a tease, Lou. <laughs> It goes back to one of the first things we talked about. A director is a problem solver. And if you give direction, uh, if you have an idea, you sort of, you have to have an idea of how to explain it or illustrate it in order for the actor to say, oh, I get it. Yeah. And, you know, so, and, and again, you did that time and time and time again throughout your career. Yes. Uh, there's uh, Pat Hingle, who uh, wonderful actor, mm-hmm. no longer with us, mm-hmm. Broadway and movies and everything, said um, at one point he and I were doing something together, and the director was uh, trying to, you know, work with the method way with Pat, and was going through these convoluted this and that. And Pat said, uh, "Listen, we'll save a lot of time. Just give me a line reading." And the director, went, "What? What? Yeah, okay." And gave the line reading, and then Pat figured out how to supply all this under stuff that made the characters say it in the first place. Uh, so there's many ways, because there are so many different uh, actors. Mm-hmm. And But that was Pat's. He perfectly uh, fine. Uh, don't don't give yourself a hernia. Just give him the line reading. Yeah. Uh, one time I was in the back seat of a, of a limo, mm-hmm. and I was on the floor. But it was a two-shot with Dean Stockwell and, and, and the guest actress. Uh, some series, I forget. It could have been that first Monday. I don't know. And he just wasn't getting it. And I would whisper a little bit of whisper. And now he said this, and I say this really in the humblest of fashions. Uh, but he said, Lou, listen, do it for me. You're a better actor than I am. Mm-hmm. Well, that put me in a terrible spot. And I, I wouldn't dare act it for another actor. Yeah. And so well, I just talked a little bit more. But Ralph Waite also said that to me mm-hmm. once. Lou, you do it. You're better. Uh, and well, Ralph and I not only did Cool Van Luke together, but we were at the actor's studio together, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And that p- would put me in a bad spot. And they weren't, it wasn't sarcastic. They just wanted to understand what I was trying to get from them. Now, that is a, a brave, selfless actor that would say, yeah. Lou, you do it for me. That way I'll get what you mean. Yeah. And it it, it, again, it it goes back to trust. Yeah, you know, yeah. In that moment, they trusted you that you were going to show them how to do it, so that it would better their performance versus showing them up. You know, because and and again, it's like that's a skill that serves you that that served you well and serves and I would think serves any actor director well the ability to do it, illustrate it. Show how it's done, so that so that serves the actor and the performance, and not yourself. Right, and I, I admire those, and they they didn't say it in seek. I mean, well, they were only the, the driver and the sound man in the front seat, and me and the actress and and Dean in the back seat. Mm-hmm. But uh, when Wade said it, it was in it was in also a movie of the week that he was producing mm-hmm. uh, with Lee Remick, mm-hmm. God bless her, yes. and uh, it, so it was totally. Let's just make a better film here. Do it for yeah. me. Uh, it, it was uh, that was very brave of him, you know, because he was the boss. He was the producer. It was his company that was producing this movie of the week. And I have to admire those two guys for for even putting it that way. Our guest this hour is Lou Antonio. Lou's book, 
Cool Hand Lou is available in soft cover and as an ebook through our friends at McFarland Books. You can order it by calling 800 253 2187. 800 253 2187 or go to McFarland Pub. Dot com. If you want an autograph edition of Cool Hand Lou from Lou Antonio himself, you can contact Lou through his website, louantonio.com. We talked about Newman, who you worked with on Cool Hand Luke. We talked about Ralph Waite, who you worked with on Cool Hand Luke. Another alumnus of Cool Hand Luke that you worked with more than once after that film was Wayne Rogers. Oh, gosh. Oh, Love that man. Gosh. Very, very smart man, too. Oh, smart. You ought to read his book about the finances. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, I tell you, not only was he a fine actor, but he was so smart. He's a Princeton guy. Mm -hmm. And his friend was Peter Falk, and Peter was doing okay. <laughs> uh, kind of fishing his money away, you know. And, and he said he came to Wayne and said, said you gotta help me here Wayne and so Wayne would say okay this we'll do this I'll invest this and that well Peter then it was so successful the word got out mm -hmm. from Peter that oh yeah and there was Wayne helping like three or four of his friends with investments and and, and Wayne at that young age was already on a few companies board of directors mm -hmm. <laughs> even while he was acting and, and then it got to be where he just turned it into a business yeah but he was so smart and a good guy Really a good guy. Yeah. His, uh, one time we went over to his house after working in, in Los Angeles, and his two children were there. They were maybe eight, nine, or ten, and boy and a girl. And when we came in, they, they said, okay, Daddy. And they did a, they improvised a scene for him. And they would do that every night that he would come home from work. Is that the sweetest thing? Yeah. Oh, I adored that man. Yeah. And he, we worked together, well, like for one time, I directed him in a really. It was it was a movie, movie of the week. It was a movie of the week. Yeah, one terrific guy. That's it. One terrific guy was based on a true story. Oh boy, talk about headlines! I mean, it's in the headlines now with this uh, massager trainer for the Olympic yes, girls. Yes, yes, yes. So this this was in Beverly Hills, but yeah. we couldn't shoot it in Beverly Hills mm -hmm. for fear of uh, uh, being sued. Yeah. So we went down to Atlanta uh, to shoot it. In a, in essence, we started. The influx of movies into Atlanta, I mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. I say that with some uh, acuity. <laughs> but, yes. So, but we, we, in other words, we did a lot together. You bring up shooting one terrific guy in Atlanta. That, again, this, this goes back to both problem solving and uh, particularly uh, dealing with some of the challenges in television, you know, uh, dealing with network people. You found very early in your career, uh, particularly once, you know, you were, there was a 20-year stretch, folks, where if there was a big-budget movie of the week or miniseries, Lou Antonio would inevitably be the guy they would tap to say, okay, Lou, we want you to do this. Whether it was something for Joey, whether it was Rich Man, Poor Man, Book 2, I mean, you did so many of those. And they, they were rewarded either in nominations, Emmy nominations, or more often than not, they won their time slot, which is another form of recognition. But you learned early on when you're directing Movies of the Week, Lou, that whenever you're able to take the production out of town, whether it's Atlanta whether it's um, Toronto, whether it's Seattle, wherever, you know. Yes. Um, a lot of times you will find local actors who will do just as well, if not better, than anyone you bring in. Plus, because network people don't want to leave the network, <laughs> it, gives you, it gives you more autonomy as the director. Oh, man, I, and that's a blessing. <laughs> really, really and truly. They have to get out of town because if they're afraid, if, if they vacate their little seat of power, mm -hmm. someone else is going to put their butt in it very That's quickly. Right. That's right. That's right. Which is good for Lou and good for the movie. <laughs> and yeah, and you can't. And also, uh, well, take, take uh, one terrific guy. A woman wrote that, as I recall. So we shot in Atlanta. Well, now, they wouldn't probably pay it, but they would have, bring the original writer down. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when I would. Uh, get a script and uh, agree to do it uh, after certain discussions, I would say, I, but I want to read the original script first. In other words, before you guys got your hands on it. Mm -hmm. And many is the time when uh, the one with Lee Remick and Ralph Waite, mm -hmm. 
I brought in the original writer in New York. Uh, managed to hide it in the uh, transportation expenses, mm -hmm. and and we went back to so many of his original dialogues and stuff that had been changed by all those people trying to make an impression at the studios, oh. at the network. Oh, yeah, uh, Arnold, Arnold Margolin. Oh, wonderful, and his brother Stuart Margolin, a pearl. Mm -hmm. But Arnold, uh, I, we had to talk, and I, now, I, I don't know if I ever did this more than once, but... I wanted to show my rough cut to Arnold mm -hmm. first. Now, mind you, they had brought in I don't know how many writers to rewrite. And Arnold uh, looked at it and he said, uh, well, well, Lou, except for that one little thing there, I don't have anything else to say. I like it. And, he, and then as we were walking out of the screening room, he said, no one has ever asked me to do what you just asked me yeah. to. But, you know, talent is talent. And if it, and yes, you'll argue with it and discuss it, and you, you know you won't roll over dead, and they won't roll over dead. So you exchange; it's the interchanging of of, of talents and ideas that are that, that's what's exciting. And go and going back to location, and you know, talent is talent, whether they're in Hollywood or whether they're in Dallas, Texas. Sometimes it's kismet, sometimes it's out of necessity, sometimes it's something that you recognize in the moment. You know, Lou. But you will discover a talent such as a Renee Zellweger. Oh gosh, yes! Oh Renee, what a dear! Wow, this little cute bundle of—I was down in Texas. Was it wasn't it the Henry Thomas? No, no, no. It was the. Uh, yeah, I was the one about the oil rig. I think. Yeah, and the local Texas woman, the casting woman, started sending me the local actors. Henry Thomas among them at one time. Mm -hmm. Uh, before uh, E.T., <laughs> I mean, he was just, he was, oh, well, there's a funny story about here, Danny, but Zellweger had been making a living, a little cute 21-year-old or whatever, doing commercials mm -hmm. in Texas. Nobody knew about her. And in comes this little thing, uh, and uh, my, my jaw just dropped when she read. It was just, and uh, number one, physically, mm -hmm. she was so appealing. Mm -hmm. Ex-gymnast. I mean, she was really, and, and so without airs. And it, you would discover things like that on location. And there are former actors all over the world. When I was down in Louisiana, this guy came in to read for me, kind of a sleazy-looking guy who was sort of a local disc jockey in a way, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I said, now listen, let's do this thing. He said, listen, Lou, as he, after he read the audition, he said, uh, you know, I was in the original radio production of War of the Worlds, mm -hmm. Orson Welles, War of the Worlds. And he said, I've got a cassette of it if you'd like it. What? You bet. And this guy gave me a recording, and he was in it, of the War of the Worlds, that famous radio show that scared America. <laughs> I mean, you're always going to run into somebody interesting on location. Yeah. Yeah. I think the movie where you discovered uh, Renee Zellweger and that you worked with Henry Thomas on, that was the movie you shot with Mean Joe Green, right? The Henry was Mean Joe Green, yeah. Okay. All right. But, okay. Renee was another movie, right? Yeah, I think that was with Jason Bateman. Oh, okay. Okay. No, I, I, no you're, you're right. You're right. I'm, get, I'm cross morphing my movies. But I tell you what, what's, what's also fun about that is, uh, which I did mention in the book, is that when the Universal head of movies television there saw the dailies of her and said, who is she? Yeah. Gosh, who is that girl? I mean, they just knew when they saw her on film. And sure enough, she went on to prove it. You know, you bring up an interesting point. Okay. A lot of times you can watch dailies and you can realize, okay, that's a talented person. If she's not under contract, with someone they, they ought to be, okay? So you can recognize talent when you see it. Now, you have a funny story, and you, re you, you return to this, and, it, and it, ha it goes back to your stage career, where you being one or two years out of Oklahoma University, you, you sort of said, when you read a play, why can't you recognize whether it's good? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and that is... That that is one of those questions that people are still trying to answer today. <laughs> you know, yeah. yes, I remember that. I, I I know this. I know that's not a question, but that's the way my mind works sometimes. You know, because you you said something that triggered that. But seriously, I've talked to one or two record producers, and they say they know a hit when they hear one, but their answer is always different. So, to you, what to you makes a good 
play, whether it's a play for the stage or a play for television or a play for the screen? What? Well, that's a toughie because they're, they're hard to come by. Mm -hmm. uh, but read Tennessee, read Arthur Miller, read some of the young ones today uh, that are happening. Somehow, and different people, uh, like, like I'm going to have a, a meeting later today mm -hmm. of somebody that's been hired, a young woman who's been hired to direct a movie, mm -hmm. never directed before. And so she's going to come over with her script, and we're going to go through it and talk about it and so forth. But my first thing that I will ask her is, what about this script appeal to you? What interested you in this script? If she says the people, the plot, or whatever, and then I'll know where she's coming mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard, uh, as most of us know, you can't, we're doing it for an audience, but we can't just do it for the audience. Right. Uh, maybe I should give that a different line, but we can't just do it for the audience. <laughs> the well, because, well, be, well, because, you know, if it's a play, the audience is going to change every night. That's right. And boy, do they. And yeah. they tell us what to do. Yeah. They really do tell us what to do. In my directing class at the studio, I said, okay, this is the way you see it. How does the audience see it? Mm -hmm. And I brought up a, a perfect quickie, and I'll make it a quickie. I'm directing this one about a bunch of uh, nurses during the Vietnam War, and one of them kind of wants a drink now and then. So I worked with this young actress about what, why she needs a drink and all of that stuff and so forth, and we got it and everything. Now, when we did it at a preview in front of an audience, they laughed when she asked for a drink. I went, how did that get by me? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, they tell us an awful lot. That's uh, And Patty Lupone has some words about the work that's done before an audience and mm -hmm. the work that's done because of the audience. Yeah, and you got some stories about this in the book where that could be a trap that an actor can fall into, that just because you got a laugh with that line last night, if you try to recreate it in tomorrow night's performance, that may not be good for the play as a whole. So you... Yes, I bring that up once uh, with Elizabeth uh, Taylor mm -hmm. and in the, the Noel Coward play we did. Mm -hmm. And another time that Garson Kanan, my very first Broadway play, that Garson Kanan was directing. And after we had, uh, it was a comedy, mm -hmm. uh, had been a hit in London. But no, in Paris, it was still running in Paris after mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. And Ruth Gordon was the star of this. But it was not a, a set up rim shot mm -hmm. kind of comedy. It mm -hmm. wasn't at all. And so we opened in, in Philadelphia. And his note the next day, was some of you were going for the laughs, not the moment. Mm -hmm. So you've got to go for the moment and not the laugh. Yeah, yeah. Or you won't get the laugh. All right, because and and again, it goes back to what we talked about before. It comes down to the work, and then and in that case, the moment will serve the work in in the long run. You know, through, you know, so that the play continues its run versus that momentary. Okay, you know, go for the laugh. It's almost a basic, but it's. I don't know, was it in sitcoms? I mean, sitcoms are really good now, I'm told. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what, was it Vaudeville? Who the hell knows? Where, yeah. where, where, where did, you know, do a double take and, uh, oh, that's another one. I said to my other class, I said, you know, when you did the double take, though, you know, when I did the what, the actors <laughs> said. <laughs> 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 so, well, yes, we do have to have another language now. Yeah. Yeah, or th this may not be a good example, but I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head. If you were to say, like what Henry Fonda does, and if they say, what? Who's a Henry Fonda? Then you just say, well, like Jane Fonda, because Jane's still on television. Jane's on television. Right now. So that might work for you in the moment, you know? <laughs> oh, Jane is, is, God, she just gotten better every day of her life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll take a quick time out, then we'll continue our conversation with Lou Antonio here on TV Confidential. Story Salon is Los Angeles' longest-running storytelling venue. We have live shows every Wednesday in Studio City, as well as solo shows, podcasts, CDs, and several books. Los Angeles Daily News calls Story Salon gemstones of narrative, something new, funny, astonishing. Sunset Magazine says, tales tall, tragic, and tantalizing. All of this makes Story Salon one of the most eclectic entertainment experiences available. You can learn more about us by going to our Facebook page or by visiting our website at www. 
That's StorySalon.com. Ed Robertson here to tell you how you can get a free first ride with Uber, the mobile app that connects you with the ride at the touch of a button in just a matter of minutes. Uber has drivers in cities across the country and around the world, while payment is seamless and cashless. To download the app, go to Uber.com and enter the promo code TV Confidential, all one word, and you will receive a free first ride up to $20. To sign up directly with the promo code included, go to get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential, get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential. If you've listened to TV Confidential and like what you've heard, please consider supporting our efforts by becoming a patron of our show through Patreon. It's easy to do and costs as little as a dollar a month. For more information, go to patreon.com forward slash TV Confidential or click the Patreon button on the homepage at tvconfidential.net. Ed Robertson, along with her friend Donna Allen Figueroa, who I understand has a new book out. Yes, it's entitled Fall Again Beginnings. It's the first part of a four-part contemporary romantic series uh, set against the background of working actors. Something that you know a, little, a thing or two well, about. Well, you write what you know, and I have been working in the business for several years. It is not necessarily autobiographical, but it's based on... Sure, many of the experiences that the actors in my book have, many have happened to me, many have happened to friends of mine. It's not, if you're looking for Valley of the Dolls, it's not, it's grounded in reality. It is grounded in reality, and it's the first in a series. Yes. Called the Fall Again series. Fall Again. Which is available as a paperback as well as an ebook and in Kindle. But Fall Again series dot com. Hello, this is Eric Braden. You're listening to TV Confidential. <laughs> Ed Roberts with a reminder that the next edition of TV Confidential will premiere next week on this station at the usual time. We hope you'll join us for that. In the meantime, our guest this hour is actor, director, screenwriter, and author Lou Antonio. Lou's book, Cool Hand Lou, My 50 Years in Hollywood and on Broadway, is a memoir of his life and career as an actor, screenwriter, and director that also serves as an homage to the many teachers who graced his life one way or another throughout his career. Cool Hand Lou is available in soft cover and as an ebook through our friends at McFarland Books. You can order it by calling 800-253-2187, 800-253-2187, or go to McFarlandPub.com. If you want an autograph edition of Cool Hand Lou from Lou Antonio himself, you can contact Lou through his website, LouAntonio.com. You have a great line about Quinn Martin in your book. And again, it speaks to what other actors have told me. If you got on Quinn Martin's radar, you were guaranteed at least 10 jobs a year simply because he would always bring you back and he had so many shows on the air. Right. Plus, you're unusual because you actually met him. Oh, yeah. Carol Rawson is, is another person you and I have in common. And she met him accidentally. And and she told me that was unusual because once the actors were cast, Quinn stayed out of the way. He worked on the next set of scripts, and he let the people he hired do their job. He didn't interfere. Yep. He was a glorious guy in that regard. He, and gosh, he had I don't know how many shows on the air. But the best line along that was Grant Tinker mm -hmm. when, when he was running MPM and then later NBC. But he, I didn't even know how it came up. But he, he said, and I was directing for him then, mm -hmm. he, he said, I hire somebody because they're good. Yeah. I wouldn't hire them if they weren't. So if they're good, I just leave them alone. Yeah. Smart. Very smart. Very smart. And, and I understand Jim Garner ran his production company the same way. Jim did. A, I don't know how he ran the production company, but I just know that uh, because you never thought, oh, he's the boss. Yeah. No, he's, he's the guy you get a chance to have work with. That's what he was. 
Well, uh, but I, I go afield. He told me, he told me, Lou, that I keep an eye on what's going I mean, I know what's going on, but I don't micromanage because I believe people do their best work if you give them the space to do their job. Well, he was, uh, he was a master at it. Yeah. You never saw a better, a happier crew. Yeah. And, and this, and this is also, I don't know if I even mentioned this, but when we were getting ready to go to do the, um, Las Vegas thing that I told you about, the mm-hmm. Boulder, Colorado, mm-hmm. the Boulder, the Boulder mm-hmm. Dam thing, mm-hmm. well, uh, he, he wanted to get out of there fast so the guys could get, you know, back and all that stuff. Now, mind you, it's a full day's work, but Andy Jackson, his, uh, cameraman, whose mm-hmm. father was a cameraman, mm-hmm. uh, who told me, and Andy said to me, you know, Lou, uh, when my dad was a cameraman, directors never set up the camera the cameraman did and then Kazan verified that later when he did a, a Tree Grows in Brooklyn out here at 20th Century Fox he worked with the actors mm-hmm. he staged it and then the cameraman would put where the camera goes yeah. so we've come a, a, a well we've come a long way I don't know if we've helped any but we've <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Garner so this day they wanted to get out of there and still I only had one 35 millimeter camera that big old boobie and that crew you never saw we got out of there at three in the afternoon mm-hmm. with a twelve-page day. They and of course, Jim was immaculate. Everybody was on top of their game, and we got out of there at three after twelve-page day. I tell you, you. That's why I say Hollywood crews are the best in the world. Louis Delgado told me once that on, on Rockford Files in particular, but on other shows, Jim's crews were so efficient that once Universal had a, had a team observe them so that they can implement what, what Jim was doing on some of their other shows to keep them under budget. Huh. Well, that was smart of Universal. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few smart things they did. <laughs> My gosh. I'm glad you know Louie. He was a wonderful... Oh, I love... I mean, I, I miss Louie. I mean, Louie Louis was a straight-shooting person. What you see is what you got. And oh, gosh. I was I was shooting something down in down south somewhere, and there was a street called Delgado Street. Yeah. I took a picture of it and sent it to. Him. <laughs> he said, "My people, my people." Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay, just just a couple of more questions. Sure. Um, you did a couple of FBI's. I think you had in both of your shows. I think you had scenes with Ephraim Zimblis. Do you have any memories of working with uh, Ephraim Zimblis? That's one of the one of the great guys. The biggest impression he made on me. Uh, in another area, we were on location somewhere out of town, or into, I didn't matter. Anyway, he drove up in his vintage Packard convertible. Yes, I, yeah, I heard about that. Ah, and he got out and he unscrewed the hood ornament. Because mm-hmm. he was afraid someone would steal it. <laughs> they were doing a show about the FBI, and he's afraid of somebody stealing something off his car. <laughs> <laughs> that struck me as funny. Anyway, he was a consummate pro, and I mean that not in a cold way. No. He he was off stage for you. He would crack up. I was having trouble in that one thing I told you about, mm-hmm. uh, about the producer. The director would say, oh, yeah, you got through the master code. Let's do it. No, but he was there. His confidence was comforting yeah. to the other actor. Yeah, and I wish I could have had a chance to direct him, but he was just there for you, mm-hmm. always, always leaning in to watch the other actor. Yeah, and did I tell did I tell you the one about uh, when I uh, when he said it's uh, you ever hear the word smog? No. Well, it's in the book, I think. I don't know, but so I repeat myself. So what? I was played the bad guy again, and I came out from New York as I used to do mm-hmm. uh, in, in the summertime. And it was hot, and we were in Glendale, mm-hmm. and my bad guy had to run and jump over and climb over a fence. And get a, and, I, and I was in shape then. I was an ex-athlete. Mm-hmm. And, and after about two takes, I was rough. <sighs> and I said, gosh, is him, I, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm out of breath. He said, Lou, have you ever heard of the word smog? <laughs> My eyes are burning. He said, "Yes." In those days, it was murder. Yeah, they used to have smog alerts. Mm-hmm. Do you remember those? Yes, I do. Gosh, if there was too much smog, to try not to leave the house. I yes. mean, and stuff like that. Yeah. But that's the kind of guy he was. Yeah. He he kept his eye on the other person. It just wasn't about him. Yeah. 
I, I, I really adore him. He's such a good guy. And his daughter is so talented. Very, very talented. Very, very Oh, good. she's wonderful. I, I had a chance to talk to Stephanie many years ago. She was a lot of fun. And, be, and, and it went so well. I mentioned to Stephanie, I wrote a book on Maverick. I mean, if I sent you a copy, would you send it to your father? And she said, sure. And I did it. And then like two months later, I got a call. It was Ephraim. And he said, thank you. Oh, see, there you go. Yeah. There you go. And Steph is the same thing. She's, uh, she's wonderful. Very much so. And I wish she were working more, and I'm sure she was. But, you know, things happen in our business and, and well, stuff. Yes, but you know, look, go, going back to Netflix and some of the streaming p- platforms, they're giving opportunities to actors of a certain age. So, you know, I mean, a lot of actors, a lot of actors in their 70s or 80s are, are appearing on all these shows because there's so many of them. So you never know. And we, and we have a lot of industry people listen to our show, Lou. So, uh-huh. um, you know, so maybe a casting director will say, you know, may, let's look up Stephanie Zimblist. Oh, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. And number one, she sings. God, can that woman yes. sing? Yes. Yes, she can. Yes, she can. Okay, final question for now, because if all goes well, I'd love to have you back on our show. But sure, I'd love this one. I'm fun. Final question for now. You mentioned you come from an athletic background. You know, specifically, you originally wanted to be a baseball player. So, yes. Uh, yes. as as we record this conversation, uh, we're a few weeks away from spring training. Which team do you follow? Well, <laughs> Boston Red Sox. That's that's what I thought, because because Ted Williams was one of your very first. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It did, and I wanted. I was a catcher, and I wanted to be Bertie Tebbit mm-hmm. in those days. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we 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 had a thing called the Y, the Y League, YMCA League, was mm-hmm. you know like under twelve, twelve and under, and then twelve to fourteen or something. Mm-hmm. So we were always playing ball. It was just expected of young, uh, young men in those days, young sons. You just you just you did athletics. Mm-hmm. And I, I, when I went to high school, I was a, a, a two-sport letterman and just loved it and then got hurt and stuff like that. But the, the Red Sox, I still follow because I, you know, this, I think it, I, I told the story of when I had a signing at the actor studio um, um, when I first met Lee Strasberg and he, we talked about Willie Mays and, yeah. <laughs> and Ted Williams. And he's still on my mind. Yeah. I mean, I can still see that swing. Wow, mm-hmm. gosh. Mm-hmm. And and then when I went up to Boston uh, to visit my grandson who was in college there, but the poor Red Sox weren't doing well at all. But I got on one of the little tour buses and then went around and went to Fenway Park and stuff like that. And and I'm so glad this to see they've snapped out of it. No, but it's a it's a great town and uh, and Ted Williams, Bertie Tebbit's my idols. I watched a couple of games at Fenway. One time I sat in the bleachers and I, I'll never forget this. It was a hot day in the middle of July. And it was a one-sided game. I think they were playing Milwaukee. And someone decided to bring a beach ball. And, <laughs> and, and now in, 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 in L.A., beach balls in the stand, that's part of the culture. But it doesn't work in other cities. And I learned that in Boston because it landed in the bullpen. And one of the pitchers got a rake. And, and the, he got the crowd worked up. And people were saying, rake, 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 rake. And he took the rake and he smashed that beach ball. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a scene. Yeah, very, very much so, very much so. <laughs> Lil, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it's been to spend some time with you. Uh, I hope we'll have a chance to chat again on TV Confidential. I, I hope so, too, because it's been great fun for me. And I must say it's- if I ever do another one of these, I hope it, it equals the fun of this one. And 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 and, and you are skills, my gosh! Uh, you know, you didn't hardly hardly talk about yourself. Well, the the way I see it, my it, this is the Lou Antonio show. Whenever <laughs> that's that's the idea. Cool Hand Lou is available in soft cover and as an ebook through our friends at McFarland Books. You can order it by calling eight hundred. 253-2187, or go to McFarlandPub.com. If you want an autograph edition of Cool Hand Lou from Lou Antonio himself, you can contact Lou through his website, LouAntonio.com. A reminder that the deluxe edition of Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, is available exclusively through UltimateSymbol.com forward slash Ella and includes a two-CD set with more than 40 studio 
and or live tracks of Ella Fitzgerald in her prime as well as the hardcover book. All 40 tracks in the CD set were personally selected by Jeffrey Mark himself from all four of Ella's four major recording labels, Decca, Verve, Capitol Records, and Pablo. Proceeds from the sale of the deluxe edition will be donated to the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation. To order the deluxe edition of Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald, go to ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella, ultimatesymbol.com forward slash Ella. That'll do it for a program tonight, folks. Ed Robertson, on behalf of Tony Figueroa, Donna Allen, Phil Grice, and Greg Airbar, thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time on TV Confidential. <laughs>